thanks for having me uh, as part of this panel. And uh, uh, money and mindfulness, no? we can just sort of switch into there. I think probably you can be pretty rich uh, making uh, pretty rich uh, with mindfulness these days. And uh, how does mindfulness relate to money? So um, I want to take this uh, opportunity to uh, discuss some of the, uh, address some of the, what we learned from a uh, critical reflection on the collective and transcultural aspects of the recent spread of mindfulness-based interventions. And I will argue that um, a discussion of these aspects is largely relevant also to uh, the related issues in uh, transpersonal psychology, because both mindfulness and transpersonal psychology share um, uh, cultural origins in the sense that both arise out of this confluence of Western and other cultures, and also um, they have a shared cultural context, which is uh, today late capitalism. Um, and so uh, I think of mindfulness and transpersonal psychology somewhat of maybe brothers and sisters, <laughs> maybe uh, distant uh, cousins. Um, and so a lot of what I will say about uh, mindfulness now, uh, I think that we can also translate directly to some of the practices uh, and teachings that we have in transpersonal psychology. So please keep that in mind. So what's up uh, with uh, uh, mindfulness? Um, there is a real sarvata. There's a real um, uh, attention in the uh, mindfulness discourse these days between advocates of a uh, the mindfulness revolution or the mindfulness movement and advocates of the mindfulness um, backlash. And uh, my intention here is to draw uh, um, our uh, attention to some of the underlying social and cultural issues involved in this uh, debate, uh, which are also directly relevant to the uh, past, the present, and the future of transpersonal psychology. So I think in general we have to acknowledge that if we extract the spiritual or religious uh, practices, teachings uh, from the uh, times and cultures in which they originated, then um, the uh, meaning, the function, and the effects that these practices acquire in their new cultural context are dramatically altered. Uh, and this is exactly what has happened in the case of mindfulness. So, in the uh, past decades, mindfulness has become separated from uh, the, its origins in Buddhism, Buddhist ethics, uh, Buddhist philosophy, and Buddhist soteriology, and uh, based on a growing body of scientific evidence for its efficacy, it has spread from the, um, uh, uh, from the uh, clinical and medical uh, establishment uh, further into uh, educational settings, corporate settings, and other contemporary settings. And uh, if we look at the spread of mindfulness, this recent spread uh, from our uh, viewpoint of transpersonal psychology, which continues to be sort of marginalized, in a way we can be a little bit uh, jealous, um, but also um, I think in follow, I will raise also some real downsides um, of this uh, recent spread. Um, yeah. So, um, this spread maybe has been uh, facilitated by a, a perennial, perennialist view. Sorry, wrong slide. Yeah. So, this spread has been facilitated by, the, by a perennialist view of, of mindfulness. Um, as a universal human agent that is independent of cultural and historical contexts. Um, and I think in transpersonal psychology there is uh, um, a lot of resonance with this uh, per perennialist view. Um, however, this view also puts a mindfulness and related practices at risk of being employed as a technology to accommodate people to individualistic, consumerist, and corporate values. And I think this should really catch our attention. And so I think we need to uh, reevaluate how our own cultural assumptions, our institutional structures, and economic systems have uh, shaped this development, and whether or not we will uh, continue to give consent to it. So, um, given the situation, um, uh, it's no wonder that there are some traditional uh, religious concerns also um, that have been uh, part of this mindfulness uh, backlash. And while these are um, certainly understandable and partially constructive, they are also um, uh, reactionary and largely defensive 
and they failed to take into account the pluralistic nature of Western society, as well as the unavoidable transformation of Buddhism as it encounters modernity and mixes with the dominant values of Western cultures. So rather than to fall back into a traditionalist uh, critique, I think it's necessary to have a fresh look at these uh, recent developments from the perspective of historical, uh, cultural, and transcultural studies. And what arises from this distinction uh, is, a dis uh, is a distinction of, uh, of neoliberal versus critical forms of mindfulness. And um, the, uh, this distinction highlights how neoliberal values in capitalist discourses have shaped mindfulness to become what, in the words of Michel Foucault, is a technology of the self. Uh, and in these discourses, uh, stress, disengagement, and discontent are represented as uh, pathologized phenomena that relate to the level of the uh, individual, which further allow for a framing of mindfulness uh, as an instrumental and privatized practice. And this has the effect of uh, depoliticizing mindfulness by avoiding a critical engagement with the causes and conditions of social suffering that are implicated in the power structures and economic systems of capitalist society. The related biomedical uh, paradigm further uh, reinforces the notion that disease as well as uh, health and well-being are matters of autonomous uh, individuals, which is an individu individualistic worldview which exaggerates internal pathology and understates environmental stressors. This focus on internal pathology further deflects attention away from cultural context. In this view of mindfulness as a disciplinary apparatus, the mind and the body become sites for um, self-disciplinary control, self-surveillance, and self-optimization, which also serves to ensure that human beings are constituted as private and atomistic individuals that voluntarily participate in their own governance and come to forget the bonds of uh, solidarity and collectivity. This ideolo ideology of individuality strongly resonates with neoliberal values and a view of mindfulness as a lifestyle choice that goes hand in hand with market um, imperatives for consumption, efficiency, productivity, and social order. Uh, all this is the result of a universal, asocial, and ahistorical view of mindfulness, which I think should be replaced by forms of mindfulness that are critical, socially aware, and engaged. <coughs> Such novel forms of practicing and teaching mindfulness would allow for a critical pedagogy which challenges, interrogates, and ultimately transforms our deeply rooted Western cultural values and assumptions. Otherwise, mindfulness and related practices run danger of, perhaps unintentionally, preserving the status quo and maintaining institutional structures that contribute to our self social suffering. And such a critical pedagogy will, first of all, examine how mindfulness is shaped by our own cultural assumptions, institutional structures, and economic systems. And secondly, it will empower voices that provoke questions and challenge the status quo. On a collective level, social criticism may then be aimed at exposing the hidden assumptions, the misconceptions, and ideologies below the surface of mindfulness, of modern mindfulness discourses. And this is a form of criticism that may lead to a reformation and a reorientation of these practices to enhance the common good and to open space to raise important ethical and political questions. So if we do not uh, work towards these goals, then the mainstream accounts will continue to leave out the real effects of social, political, and economical factors, as well as situational stressors caused by our own major institutions themselves. If uh, one day we will succeed at this challenge, then mindfulness may effectively realize its emancipatory potential of fostering civic or social mindfulness, in which those who practice and teach mindfulness turn our attention not only inwards, but also outwards to include those institutions, histories, and socio-economic as well as cultural influences that contribute to and are often the cause 
of social suffering. And uh, I sincerely hope that both mindfulness and transpersonal psychology are willing to face this challenge head on. <coughs> so um, if you're curious to learn more about uh, such critical views, I'd like to refer you to these two publications, which I've used in my uh, preparation. One is a Handbook of Mindfulness published by uh, Springer Verlag, and then a book uh, by Jeff Wilson called uh, Mindful America. Uh, I also want to say I'll be uh, presenting a poster uh, just after this on uh, uh, social aspects of mindfulness, and uh, I'll be also hosting a workshop tomorrow morning if you want to come and do some uh, relational mindfulness practices. So thank you for your attention.